guys. Uh, thanks for coming out to the Maxon booth. Also, thank you to Maxon for invi inviting me again. And hello, Internet. Actually, my mom is watching. So hi, mom. Um, yeah, today I want to talk about the making of uh, of the Nike Mercurial X spot that we did. Um, I'm a freelancer and I work in Mainz, which is close to Frankfurt, and we have a, a small office with some other freelancers. And um, yeah, we produced this bot in a super small team of only three people. And uh, before I explain you how we did it, um, let's take a look at the actual spot. Thanks, guys. All right, so that's the Nike Mercurial X. Um, end of last year, um, I got an email from an advertise advertising agency from London, which is called Village Green. Very nice guys. And they asked me to do a style frame for a print campaign. And it was just a, a tire and some smoke around it, like a burnout. And I did that. It was a lot of fun. And shortly after that, they wrote me another email. OK, now Nike wants to have a commercial, like a one-minute piece featuring this shoe and a car. And I was like, oh, OK, car. I did a lot of car, job, car jobs in the past, and I kind of tried to get rid of cars. Um, but then they came up with the initial brief. So uh, they told me a lot of stuff about the whole campaign and how everything should work. But there were a few keywords uh, that triggered in my mind. Um, one was, uh, it should be a fast and dangerous street race. And I thought, OK, cars are actually not too bad if you can make something like that. Uh, the second thing was, it should have neon and lasers. I was like, OK, I like laser. So uh, that sounds pretty good. And the last uh, thing which uh, actually made me jump onto the job was they wanted burnouts. So who doesn't like burnouts um, with those uh, street race things? Uh, the whole campaign is about taking the shoe and pair it somehow with the aggression and the speed and the danger of, a, of an illegal street race at night. So kind of this fast and furious stuff. So the shoe is so fast and so impossible, um, dangerous, you should buy it. It's super cool. Um, the problem was that I was only one guy. So I knew that uh, creating a one minute piece in that time alone is maybe a little bit too much for me and for such a big client. So I asked two friends. Uh, one is Bastian Schiffer, who is hopefully also watching. Um, he's uh, w one guy who, who sits right next to me in my office, also a freelancer. And I also told him, hey, we have to do some burnouts and lasers. And he was like, cool, yeah, uh, for a shoe, perfect. And the third guy was Martin Payag. I also know him from, from studies years back. And we worked on some projects in the past. And it always went perfectly fine. So we teamed up and uh, had some nice conversations with Village Green. So the first thing they um, sent us was actually some mood boards. So this is only a small part of uh, what they sent us, actually, just to give us an idea uh, what they have in mind style-wise, how it should look. And we try to find the visual language of uh, the stuff that they send us. So what we saw is, OK, it should definitely be super dark. They wanted to have a lot of glowing stuff here and there, like those cars that you know from the Fast and the Furious uh, movies with lights underneath the cars. And yeah, actually a car where you would usually be embarrassed to drive around with that. But for that kind of purpose, it was perfectly fine. Um, then we have a modern and urban environment, but it was not really an environment that is visible. Most of it just works through reflection in the car that we don't see too much. They want to have some nice little details. So, for example, on the car itself, we have the hello. Um, we have the Mercurial X logo somewhere on the car. So on the on the brakes or on the back of the car, we always have the Mercurial X logo somewhere hidden. 
And of course, they wanted to have a lot of reflections in there. So everything is super dark, and the whole shape of the car is basically defined through its reflections in this neon laser environment. So uh, after we talked about, about, um, about this, and the guys from Village Green recognized, OK, we know what they mean. We understood what kind of language they want to speak in this film. Um, they produced a nice storyboard for us. And they basically just used some 3D models that they found or produced, uh, staged them in a 3D scene, and uh, made some stills, and just tried to figure out a nice uh, storyline for the whole film, what they have in mind, and gave that to us and asked us for our opinions. Does that work as a film? So um, we took a look at this, and we had the feeling, OK, this could work uh, as a film. We had some ideas what we could change, how we could uh, make some of those scenes. They had a picture in mind for some scenes, but maybe not uh, how the transition from one shot to the others. So this is where we then came in. And what we then did first is a 2D animatic. So this had several reasons. So the most important is you get a feeling for length and timing of the film. So we knew that the spot itself should be around one minute. I think in the end it's one minute sharp. Um, and while you're doing storyboards, it's pretty hard to tell if this is one minute or it's two minutes or 30 seconds. It's just you don't understand how long each image is in the film. And uh, this is pretty good if you then make a 2D animatic and just cut one picture after the other and try to estimate the length of each shot. Um, you also can break down the film into shots afterwards. So because in the, in the animatic, not every picture has to be a several, uh, separate shot. Sometimes three images actually are one shot. So it was just good for us to break it down into shots, number the shots, so that we just that all of us know, uh, know what we talk about. If I say, for example, here, Bastian, let's talk about shot 50. And then he knows exactly what it is. Instead that I say, do you know this one shot where there's the car and the camera from front and there's some light going on? Do you know what I mean? And this is always a little bit hard. So it's good to bring some structure in there. Even if the shot list changes over time, over and over again. So we made a spreadsheet, basically, and produced some shots in there. And uh, one thing I learned over the time is it's always a good idea to number your shots in 10 steps. So don't name your first shot 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But after a while, you decide, OK, we need another shot in between. And then you have shot 2B or 2 point something. And so it's much better if you name the first shot 10, 20, 30, 40. And then if you have a shot in between, you can slide it in as 15 or 25. And so you have like eight slots between two shots where you can put in extra shots. And that's usually more than enough. So that's actually the 2D animatic. We also, um, Bastian also, put together a layout sound. Um, this is just sound we found everywhere from movies, whatever, just to get a feeling for the whole rhythm and the speed and the the kind of music that we see in this film. So this is the images from the storyboard, um, which are just animated in After Effects in 2D. So that was the very first version, as you can see here. Looks like this. So you can see, do you hear me? Yeah. So you can see this was, as I said, the first version of the of the whole film. But you see that there's a lot of similarities to the final product. There were shots in there that didn't make it to the final piece, but that was a. It's a good base to have something to talk about with the clients also and with the agency. 
that we just see, okay, look at this, it doesn't work that well. We have some shots in there which didn't make it into the final movie, like the wind tunnel effect which is in there, which was kind of sad, but it got kicked out. But that was what we did next. So, um, the next task was to prepare our assets that we need for the, for the film. Of course, the hero asset of the whole film is the shoe itself. And um, we had some, some points to keep in mind. So, it should be highly detailed because we have to go very, very close with the camera to the shoe. It has a pretty heavy subsurface scattering material on the sole. So, it was this silicon kind of sole. And the shoe itself, actually, the, the color on the sole it's not in the silicon, it's underneath a, a sheet of plastic which is colored in those neon colors. It's a gradient from orange to pink, and the sole itself is transparent, so we had to figure out how to do that. The shoe itself is partially covered with a rubber surface, so you can he see here this edge, so the side or here. This is covered with a rubber edge which is uh, reflective and makes, uh, makes it water repellent, I think. And the upper part of the shoe, so this area, is um, not reflective at all. It's totally diffuse uh, fabric, fabric material. Um, since we knew how much time we have and that we need this level of detail and all the textures have to be perfect like the, like the actual shoe, we knew, okay, we have to use a 3D scan because there's no uh, 3D model available for this shoe. We only had like uh, CAD data for the, for the sole, but for the shoe itself there was nothing available. Unfortunately, no one of us had big experience with uh, 3D scanning. We, we knew how photogrammetry works, but <coughs> I would, excuse me. We were all pretty sure that it's a bad idea to learn 3D scanning on an actual project. So, um, luckily, uh, I know a guy, his name is Holger Bibrach. Some of you might know his, his tools, he's producing scripts and all this stuff for Cinema 4D. And during the, the last month, he developed a pretty amazing pipeline for 3D scanning by himself. He's doing it at home. And he, he also scanned some shoes before, so we knew maybe he's the right guy. Um, so, uh, we brought it into the team and then they set the prototype, they sent it over, the prototype of the shoe to Holger and he built uh, a foot out of styrofoam to put it into the shoe, put it in his, in his rig and did the 3D scan for us. And he was kind enough to record a little screen capture. So for those of you who don't know who photogrammetry works, I'm not an expert but I, I can explain it. Um, basically you take a ton of photos of your object from different angles try to light it as diffuse as possible so don't, that you don't get highlights, that, that it's always totally flat. And then you bring those pictures into some software. For example, this is Agisoft Photoscan. And it analyzes the pictures. And then it can recalculate the object that you photographed. And all those blue planes that you see over here are actually the calculated camera angles. So the computer found out that one picture was taken from here, one from here, one from here. So, all in all, Holger made 188 angles of the shoe. He had it on a, on a tripod and turned it around slowly. But um, the thing is, we knew we had to go super close on the shoe. And um, what those photogrammetry programs don't like is depth of field. You need a sharp image. So, you have uh, the choice that you go further away with, a, uh, with, a, with another lens, but then you lose detail if everything is sharp. So, he came up with the idea to, actually, I don't know if it's his idea, but I heard it first from him, and this is pretty amazing. So, he used a macro lens on his camera where you, you can go super, super, super close on the object. The problem with a macro lens is that you have a very shallow uh, area of focus. So, only a small part of the, of the image is actually sharp. The, the rest is out of focus. Um, so, he actually took, took 12 pictures per angle with 12 different focal lengths. So, he pushed the sharp area through the image and took 12 pictures of every angle. And then he used another software, which uh, is used by macro photographers, which is a focus stitcher. So, this software basically isolates the sharp area from every image and stitches them together. I have no idea how that works, but it works. And in the end, you get a perfectly 100% sharp image of this, of this angle. And uh, he did that for every angle, so in the end, uh, we ended up with 2,256 photos of the shoe. I don't know if he still likes Nike shoes, uh, but he's seen a lot. Uh, the next problem was the rubber material here on the side, what I talked about. Um, for 3D scanning, you use as many flashes as you can, 
and distribute them and make them super soft that the light is very, very diffuse on the shoe because you don't want in the, in the texture, which is also captured by the scanning software, um, you don't want to have highlights in there. It should be totally flat. So the problem was, even if you use giant softboxes, you get some highlights in, the, in this rubber surface because it's so reflective. So uh, what Holger did is a technique that is used by uh, people who take pictures of famous oil paintings, because that oil color is also reflecting light, and you don't want to have that if you have an art catalog or something. So you basically make, take a polarization filter and put that on your flashes. So the light which comes through your flashes is linear polarized. And then you take a second polarization filter and put it on your camera and set it to 45 degree angle. And with that technique, you get rid of every reflection in the image. It's totally crazy. You take a look at the photos afterwards, and it looks like a pure diffuse channel from a th uh, 3D render. So you can get rid of all those reflections. And the good thing is, if you do both, so one with reflection and one without, and then you subtract both images from each other, you get a specular map. So this is totally crazy. And um, yeah, so we ended up with a pretty detailed scan, which was amazing and a very nice data set of textures, which was, I think in the beginning, it was 16K. In the final production, we used, I think, only 4K, but it was good to have that amount of detail. Um, this is actually uh, the screen capture from Holger, where he shows. So this is the calculated point cloud from uh, Agisoft with his angles. So, and you can see that the detail is pretty good. So he switches on the, the meshing. And afterwards, he threw it into ZBrush to do the uh, retopo, um, smooth out some of the noise that a 3D scan always produces, uh, correct when there's a hole somewhere in the mesh, close that, um, reproject uh, new topology on it. So that was actually the mesh what we are, were working with, with a pretty high detailed normal map. And uh, yeah, just prepared everything for us. So he also did a nice capture of that. So here he switches on the normal map that you can see the high detail. There's a totally diffuse texture which comes out of Photoscan, and you can see how close we can get to the surface. He also unwrapped the model in ZBrush directly so that we can also edit the texture in Photoshop. That was pretty cool because, we, uh, because it was a, a macro lens. He also captured a lot of like, uh, grain and dust on the surface so we could paint that out here. And this is the diffuse map. Uh, the, um, specular, map, specular map, what I was talking about. So this is basically the difference between the scan of the shoe with the cross-polarization technique and the one without. So if you subtract them, this is what, what uh, stays there. So you know exactly where the material is reflective and where it's not. It's a little bit retouched, of course, so we made sure that the, the text, the, the logo of Mercurial X is fine and those edges here are perfectly sharp. Um, but it, it, it helps a lot and gives you a lot of detail there. <coughs> All right. Um, yeah, so the, the shading of the shoe. We decided to use Octane because all of us, we, we knew Octane pretty good. And we also knew we were only three guys without a big render farm and we had to finish in time. So we knew using Octane, if you run out of render power, you can uh, build up your render power pretty easily just by buying some GPUs or borrow it from friends or whatever. So it's, you can simply double your render power by putting in a second graphics card. So in the end, I think we had uh, four works workstations and 11 or 12 GPUs, different GPUs mixed up, just to make this whole thing. So that was a first proof of concept um, where we made a short test render just to see how the light uh, reacts on the surface of this shoe. So, uh, and that was pretty satisfying for being a first test of that render, so we were kind of surprised. Uh, Holger's model was great. Um, usually when you do 3D scans of shoes, especially shoes with this uh, very soft fabric on top, you have to remodel the shoelaces, um, especially if the shoe has to deform somehow. In our case, that was very limited, so we, most of the times we only have a static version of the shoe. So we didn't have to care about that, but it's pretty hard in 3D scans to get those overlap areas here. So where it's something underneath something, and usually you see that, but everything was so dark, and Holger's scan was so good so that uh, we didn't have to care about that. So that was the proof that we sent over to London, and they liked it. So that was the second one where we pushed it even further. So you can see the, this is the fabric um, of our shoe, where you can see all the 
the, uh, the strings of the material, actually. And we made a slide flow over over there. Just see also here, the, you can see every, every single detail of that material. And this is everything pure scan data. So retopologized with all the high-res maps, ready to use. So that's pretty cool on 3D scans. <coughs> so uh, the second hero of our film was the car. And of course, it should still be uh, commercial for the shoe and not for the car. So I think in the beginning, they, yeah, they, they, they had some sports car in the beginning, which was some brand with a horse, I think. Um, and of course, that was uh, not what Nike wanted to see. So the guys at Village Green, they have a few modelers in-house. So they produced us this brand neutral car, which is basically uh, Frankenstein of different cars, just parts put together and somehow model it that it looks like a sports car. And uh, those rims, for example, we can see them later in more detail. Those are Nike rims. So they put a lot of very nice detail in there. And yeah, just made sure that it's not a very specific car. It looks pretty similar to other sports cars, but it's, you can't buy this car, sadly. Um, we also knew what the car has to do in our film. So actually, the, the stuff that the car should be able to do was very limited. It just had to drive around, and you had to feel some, maybe some suspension, or you should see on the body itself when it's accelerating that it leans backwards a little bit. So the, the rig itself was not that complicated. And we knew that uh, they wanted detailed shading. We were super close. So it's, it's not rocket science. It's a, it's a car paint shader that we built. But uh, they wanted to have some really nice micro scratches on the brakes. And there's uh, the Mercurial X logo engraved on the brakes also, which should be uh, with micro scratches and all that shit. So let's take a look at the scene file. Um, so actually, I was unsure if I should show this scene file because it's so simple. It's nothing fancy, but sometimes it's super important just to know um, what your model has to do. This is also why we spend a lot of time in this animatic. Uh, actually, after the 2D animatic, when we started creating our 3D scenes, we slowly started to exchange previews of the 3D scenes into the 2D animatic, so that in the end, we had our final piece just not rendered. Um, so we knew what the car had to do. And let me just show you what, what it can do, because it's super simple. So we have this main controller over here, where we can simply grab the car and move it around. Um, then we have this steering controller over here, which is also limited just to a steering. Nothing fancy. Um, and then we have the tires. And usually what I tend to do is just create a setup where you can put the car on a spline, let it ride, and then the tires run automatically. <coughs> in this case, we decided not to move the car in the whole spot. So actually, the car is always still, and only the street underneath is move moving. So it was much easier for us just to animate the camera. You don't have to build super long sets. Everything is static, and you just move the, uh, the street underneath. Also, we didn't have scenes where the car starts riding off very slowly that you can see if the wheels spin correctly and don't slide on the surface. surface. So we could focus on just make the motion blur look good. So we did it simply by hand. So this controller actually is linked to the rotation of all the, of all the tires. So what we basically did is we went in there, made a keyframe, and then usually we jumped to frame 10 and rotated it a bit, something like that, made another keyframe. And if you now take a look at the F-curve, let's make this bigger. So you, you can see that blue curve over here. And of course, if I now hit play, it runs until frame 10, and then they stop. So this is a function which is super useful. Most of you might know it, but I simply show it. So you can see that here's this gray line that, which continues and shows you the current value um, of this animation. And if you take this whole curve, go to functions, track after, and set it to continue. Oh, sorry, that was for wrong. Track after, continue. Then you can see that this curve um, goes up, up, up all the way. So if I now hit play, you will see that the tires will just spin forever. And it was pretty cool to have a setup like this. So if, you, if we rendered a short test sequence and, and thought, OK, the motion blur doesn't look so good, it should be a little bit faster. Because sometimes you get this uh, static axis then of, of a tire when it rotates in the wrong frequency. You simply grab the second keyframe and lift it up a little bit, and then you can see that the whole curve changes. So that was a pretty easy speed control for us without diving into 
uh, complex setups. Uh, the other thing we did was just give every of our tires a vibrate tag. Because if you have close-ups like this, and you hit play, and they just spin, it looks kind of unnatural. But if you let them vibrate like slightly in Y direction, and uh, they all have different random seats, so you just see them, them bouncing a little bit. And in a rendered version with motion blur, that looks pretty cool, actually. All right, and the last thing, what I like most of this setup, actually, is this controller here on top. I do that all the time when I have to animate cars. Um, this is a super simple expressor setup where we take the um, position here, the position, x and y position, of the star in relation to this square. And when you move that around, let me move that around, you can simply bank the car in all those directions. And this is a a little tweak. You don't use that too much, but it makes such a huge difference. So if you take a look at the car from the side, and when you imagine it starts to accelerate, and you do something like this, like and then it breaks, goes like this, that makes a huge difference to have those uh, tiny details. Also, when you have the car like uh, driving around from left to right, left to right, and then it simply leans a little bit that you can feel the mass of the body of the car. That makes a huge difference. And it's a super simple car rig, but it uh, solved all of our scenes perfectly. So the next thing was the car shading. So I'm super glad that Rafael Rau is not here today, because he uh, is always angry with me if I explain shading stuff in the wrong way. And this is definitely wrong. Um, but it works. So there's a thousand ways to build uh, car paint materials. But one way I found, and which looked cool at night with those neon lights, was that we simply take uh, one base material, which is this one, which has a very high index, so it's very reflective, but also a very high roughness. So it's almost like um, anodized aluminum or something. So very, very rough. And then you take a second one, which has a lower index, something like 1.6. It was in our, uh, in our case, uh, with a low roughness. So it's very glossy, very, very shiny. And then you simply mix them together. You can use a Fresnel also. So a fall off to mix them together, but we simply, I think we just mixed them and had a slider where we could define how much of each shader we use. And uh, that worked perfectly fine in our case. So we made this. This was, uh, I think it's the first uh, scene. It was also one of our first tests where we tried uh, to make some, some reflections crawl over the surface and reveal uh, those nice uh, edges of the car. So let me drink something. So we were happy with that. Um, it looked enough like lasers and uh, neon lights. Uh, what is also funny is uh, that kind of reflections that we used here, because actually we made a, a photo search in all of our holiday pictures. And um, I've been to Vegas a while back, and a friend was also in the US, and we took pictures of some neon signs on the streets. So we simply took those pictures of neon signs, put them on planes, and then moved it alongside of the car. So this is our, our reflection cards that we used all the way. Um, the next one was the street. We knew that uh, we don't need curves or something. We just need some street running underneath the, the car. Um, the client also said they want some wet street, of course, because wet streets always look better, much better. And uh, so we figured out, OK, let's make one strip of, um, of street, just one, one piece that we can put uh, um, after each other and then move it underneath the car. Um, and we wanted to have some procedural way of uh, creating those water puddles. And actually, after a while of research, I found this one here. So on YouTube, if you, take, uh, if you search for Blender Guru, there's a very nice uh, Cycles tutorial, so Cycles Render in Blender, uh, how to create realistic puddles in Blender. And the good thing is in 3D, of course, every program has its own ways of doing stuff, but some things always work the same. And if you follow this tutorial, he explains very nicely what is important uh, in creating these puddles. It's not just a noise, which uh, is a mask, because you have this tiny detail when, you, when there's the edge between the dry and the wet surface. There's a very blurred area, which is uh, not like clear water. It's more blurred, because it's a very thin film and small uh, stones coming through this. Watch the tutorial. He explains it ways better than me. So. 
ultimate screen capture here. So this is rendered on two GPUs in Octane. And it's just a clever combination of some noises. And then I have this transform node on the left side and can change some values, change the scale and the position of those puddles pretty quickly. <coughs> so for each shot, we could load in this asset and just if we knew, OK, this puddle is in the way or it doesn't look good in the reflection or we wanted weather in that place, we could just move it over, make the puddles smaller, bigger, whatever. It was fully procedural and then um, yeah, it was a, was a nice help in the production. Yeah, so let's watch it to the end. Yeah, I'm just rotating it, moving it around. So that was really a big help. So uh, then we had our car asset and the street asset. So it was time for a first test to see both in action. So that was the first thing we sent to the client over. And you can also see our, our neon signs here in the reflection on the water puddles. We thought, OK, uh, we're pretty sure this will work. Uh, we're pretty satisfied with the look of it. It was super dark. Usually, clients all, always want to make things bright. I don't know why. Uh, in every film, uh, they start super dark, and you, you think, yeah, that looks like Blade Runner and Tron and Terminator at once. Super cool. And then uh, the client thinks in the beginning, OK, maybe we make it a little bit brighter. And then in the end, you, you have something white, usually. And uh, that was pretty cool that we, uh, that we have this look here until the end. All right, so that was, I would say, the most challenging scene of the whole film. Um, most of it was done by Martin, so big shout out to Martin. Thanks for helping us here. Um, we had to figure out a way how the profile of the tire can morph into the profile of the shoe. And uh, we knew, OK, we have to go super close. Like, this is a grab from the film, actually. We have to be super close. They wanted some kind of transition effect, so this glowing edge, which should go on. And it had to look pretty detailed, and we had to control it somehow so that we know where it starts, and how it uh, transforms, in which direction, whatever. So I have also a little scene file just to explain you the very basic uh, things that we used there. So that's a technique that I also used in years back. I did my graduation film Droplets, where I had to produce. You were in the presentation, right? I remember you. OK. Uh, that's, that was actually 2012. Um, and I had to, to build a rope there. And I needed a displacement map for the rope. And I was searching how to, how to do that. And actually, I found a tutorial of a guy who built the structure of the rope like on a flat surface. He simply modeled it. And then he rendered out a depth pass of that, that you get a, a black and white image, which shows you what parts of the image uh, come out of the geometry and which not. Um, and this is what we did here. So Martin started to build this tire structure here, just a simple, simple model of the tire structure. And then he also rebuilt the structure of the shoe. So this is how the shoe looks from the, from the bottom. And then we have two cameras. Both are set to parallel, so that you don't have parallax in the render. Um, th then you set your uh, front and rear blur, that you have exactly um, a gradient, which is white at the top. And the deeper you go, it gets darker. So we rendered out some images, and they looked like this. So we rendered out 16-bit TIFF files that we have in new, uh, enough um, grayscale values in between. And uh, then we had it in 2D. Those are tileable, so we knew we can simply unwrap the tire and then throw it on there, and it will somehow fit. Uh, while Martin was working on the tire and on the shoe especially so long, and uh, he, he analyzed the, this profile of the shoe for quite some time. And Martin is a film maniac, so he watches a lot of films. And it's just a funny note on the side that we recognize that the shoe designers of Nike are obviously big fans of The Shining, because they have the same pattern on the floor. All right, so the transition itself uh, was prepared in After Effects. So we took those two images. Martin uh, unwrapped the tire because we already had some detail on the tire, which was a, a frontal projection from the side, which is this, uh, this type here and those uh, tiny lines. It was already, as a bump map, projected from the side. So he made nice UVs. Then we baked this bump map in, into this UV space that we have it also flat. And then we took it into After Effects, layered our um, two pattern on top of each other, and then we could simply create uh, mask animations mixed with noise and all the stuff, and made the whole transition in 2D. 
Uh, and the key thing for, for shading later was also that we didn't only have one displacement map. Uh, we also had some, some layers. Uh, so you can see it down here. It's uh, called emission shot and stroke shot. So for example, this line here was on a separate layer as a separate uh, sequence uh, that we can use this for the emission of the material that we have the glowing, uh, glowing effect there. Uh, that was a huge, huge comp here. I, I don't remember, actually. I think it was an. We rendered it also out as a 16K comp, so very big, because we knew we had to go so close. Um, and that brought us to the next problem, because um, Octane has a limitation in displacement, and uh, the limitation is 8K. So you can't use displacement maps which are higher than 8K. And we recognized, OK, when we use that, and we are so close, and the UV map is the whole tire, uh, we see pretty big pixels there. So we actually can't do it on render time with uh, displacement. So what we ended up doing, so this is not the final resolution that we used, but just to show you, um, Cinema 4D has uh, the displacer, which is just a deformer, which uses image maps or shaders to displace the actual mesh. So not on render, on render time tessellation, it really pushes your points in space, and you see it in viewport. So we ended up using this, and we took that piece of tire. And I think in the end, we only took the top part, which is visible, and subdivided it like very, 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 very high, and made the transition with that. And it looks like this. So it was horrible performance in the viewport, because the, the resolution was so high. But we timed it on a low resolution mesh, and right before rendering, we simply cranked it up. So that worked pretty well. and. Um, helped us in this case. Yes, so the other effect that uh, we wanted to build was the scan line was quite challenging. Uh, in the beginning, in the first boards, uh, we always talked about some light sweeping across the shoe. The problem is the shoe is not that big. And if you move lights there, basically, if you put a light there, you see the shoe. It's not so easy possible to create only a, a small glimpse of the shoe in this, uh, in this in this short um, area. So we had to figure out another way. And uh, we made a concept with the scan line and asked the guys, do, do you like that? Maybe with a scan line going over it. I mean, we talked about lasers and stuff, so this might be a good idea. Um, so we had to figure out how to build this laser line. The other thing we wanted to make is, if you have ever seen a laser show live, and they have this big laser walls moving through the fog, you can always see that there's some, uh, it looks like a slice from a cloud and the laser moves through it. So we wanted to have that also. It's, n it's actually not that obvious, but we have a little bit of noise going on here. And we wanted to have some dust particles in the air while the lasers are sweeping across it, that they just come into the light for one frame. So let me show you the setup for the, that was wrong, the setup for the laser scan. It's highly complicated because it looks like this. So actually, you can ignore that. So um, we tried different things, as I said, to create this sharp line which glows and, in best case, glows and creates light, so emission and uh, glows around uh, on the surface on the shoe. So what we ended up using was simply a plane. And this plane had uh, an emissive material in Octane, so it was just a 100% glowing plane. And then we put a dirt shader in the uh, alpha channel, so in the opacity channel of this plane. So wherever. The dirt shader on Octane is basically ambient occlusion. So wherever the plane intersects with the shoe, it will create a small uh, line in the alpha channel. So only where we have an intersection, it is visible. And by default, that's a, like a feathered line, which goes uh, until here or something. But you can uh, crank this gradient down that it generates a very sharp line. So basically, we push a, a glowing plane through our shoe. And where, wherever they intersect, it, would, it will create a very small emissive line. And that worked pretty well, and we could use it in all the shots. Also, in the one shot where we have light traveling through the sole of the shoe, that was a little bit heavier in render times, but it still worked pretty good. All right, so that was the uh, first test of our volume fog. So if I play that, you know what I mean. So this is the effect that we were looking for. And I, I don't know why I didn't try that earlier, but my first test were with Turbulence FD, creating some volumes, really scatter light through it, render times exploded, we don't have time, everyone cries. So we had to find another solution for that. And the simple solution was simply create a noise and world space. 
and then move the plane through this noise. So it's actually a static noise sitting in world space. So if you have a noise which lives in texture or in object space, and then you move your object, the noise moves with it. But if your noise is in world space, you can move an object through it, and the noise is static in the air. So that's the whole magic behind that, actually. And it was simply the noise, world space, and the opacity of our emissive plane. And then you get this effect here. Also pretty easy to render then. Um, then we took our rendered layers into After Effects, and then there was a lot of post work. So we had our shoe with the, uh, with the light from the line on the shoe, but the line itself was on a separate layer. And I threw that into After Effects, and those rays here are actually just trap code shine. So with the, with the center of the shine somewhere down here, just to create them. And then we wanted to create those dust particles, which are obviously only visible in this area where our laser is just at the moment. So we created some particles in the whole image and made them, gave them a lifetime of one frame, so they really just sparkled very shortly. And then we used uh, only the shine layer, cranked up the... Um, the contrast, so wherever we have laser lines, we get a black and white image which had super high contrast and simply use that as a mask for our particles. So the rest was just masked off. And since our laser was constantly moving, we knew the particles only had to spark for uh, one frame. So that worked out pretty good. I need to drink. So next scene that we had to tackle were the, the burnouts. We had one in the beginning, and this one, we called it the donut drift in the end. Uh, we used Turbulence FD in the past, and I think it's still the best uh, thing to produce smoke and fire in Cinema 4D. So um, we used that tool. And sadly, at the time when we started production, there was no Octane 3 with volume support, volume render support. So we were kind of forced to use two different renderers and comp them together in post. Uh, so it was rendered with physical renderer. And I have a little example also. I mean, the stuff that we did, as I said, is not rocket science. And sometimes the most easiest uh, setups are the most helpful. So let me show you this high-end scene file here. This is a torus. I made it by myself. OK. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, this is actually the real asset from the burnout scene in the beginning. We knew that we need to produce this burnout. And when you have a a spinning tire from a side. Let's see it like this. And you make a burnout. You actually produce heat down here, where the rubber goes over the, over the street. And then your, uh, your um, smoke will be produced here. And then it will rise up here, because the tire is spinning, right? So it produces some force and rises up there. In our first test, that simply didn't happen, because we didn't make the tire a collider of the smoke, because otherwise the whole turbulence field uh, gets way too crazy. <coughs> and we wanted to control pretty good where the, uh, where the thing is. Let me just make this one a little bit bigger. So what happened then? We came up with this solution, which looks like this. So basically, we cloned some cubes on our surface of the tire. So if I disable the plane effect, it looks like this. So it's just cubes on the surface. Because you also want to emit the the smoke in a little bit random way, so not the uh, same emission on all the places. Um, and with this effector, we could simply um, control when the emission starts, because those little cubes were our smoke emitters, actually. And they were also colliders for the smoke. So when the cubes made their round and go through the smoke again, they start to pull the smoke in the direction um, where they are rotating. So, and with this plane effector, it was then super easy. Just animated like that. We could dis, uh, decide, OK, we want smoke until here. And then it gets just pulled around the tire. So that was actually the smoke setup for that one. So this is the uh, raw simulation for the donut drift. Um, this is done by Bastian. Uh, we produced, uh, we actually, we modeled a low-res version of the car just with a polygon pan in Cinema 4D. We did a, a proxy geometry to make it a collider, put some proxy tires in there, and the tires were our emitters. And then we simply tried and watched what happens if we simply make them colliders and let it drift. And this is, I think, the first simulation that we had and also the last one because the, uh, it works so nicely. And those curls over here are just produced by this collider going through your simulation space and creating some vortex 
um, forces in your velocity field. So that was pretty satisfying that we had that. And this is the final shot. So here we also used the, uh, the puddle technique for making the, the street underneath. I just painted some tire marks in here. And on one tire mark, uh, if we would zoom in like 1,000%, we could read uh, Bastian, Martin, and Simon. So this is what the client did new until now. Um, yeah, so that was also pretty good. So for us, it was solved. Um, then we had this drift in the end where the tire slides into, uh, into the frame, which is the final image. And it also teaches us that it's so important to exactly know what you want to achieve. Animatic helps a lot. And then you only build what you need. It doesn't make sense. We tried in the beginning to use our cash from the donut scene and really just make the car stop in the end and then simply put a camera there. And we, pretty, uh, we, we fast recognized, OK, that doesn't make sense because the whole space is filled up with smoke. The car comes in there. It looks like the car is burning because there's smoke everywhere. And you see nothing. And it had to look, it had to look in, a, in a very specific way. So we ended up with this scene here. It's not correct, definitely not, but uh, it looked how we wanted. So we placed some small smoke emitters here on the front and pushed it towards the car, and then the car itself pulled some uh, emitted smoke in our direction, and uh, so that was um, the final shot. Unfortunately, you can see that the car drifts in and goes off to the left. That was uh, the scene how it looked like for most time of the production. Pretty much in the end, the client decided to flip the scene where you think, oh, that's not a big problem. But we rendered everything already. But then you flip the scene, and then you recognize that you have some uh, strange-looking uh, Nike swooshes everywhere. So we had to uh, re-render, because we couldn't. We tried to flip all the logos and stuff in post, but that was simply too much. So we had to re-render uh, that shot. It's much better in that direction. Um, funny enough, uh, I told you that it's so important to have a shot list that everyone knows what you're talking about when you say shot 25, and everyone is like, yeah, shot 25. This is actually the only shot that no one knows the number, because we always called it the back to the future drift, because actually our reference was back to the future. So if you take a look at this drift, this is exactly our shot. So inspired. Let's call it inspired, not stolen. And this is this short sequence as it, as it looks rendered. And then it goes off to the right. So the pack shot was another big challenge. The problem was that uh, there was a print campaign um, out there, which basically looked like this. And of course, they didn't use a 3D render of the shoe. They used a photo of the shoe. And this photo was very heavily retouched, of course, because it's uh, the official photo of that shoe. And it's almost impossible to get this light situation of a shoe in 3D if you try to, if you use physically based renderers and try to rebuild a, uh, some lights, and it's just impossible to get this look. So what we ended up was um, we we tried to push it as close as we can our render of the shoe. Then we took a still of the shoe, sent it over to the guy who made the retouch of the photo, to make a retouch of our render. So he, he just tried to rebuild uh, this look, and then he sent it back to us. And while this shoe is coming in from the left, it's our animation, but it's super dark. And then it blends over in the retouched CG render of our shoe, just to match uh, the print campaign. Did I miss something? No. So um, time is good. Um, we learned some stuff on this project, and I just wanted to share it uh, because, yeah, you, you can never learn enough. One is what I also already said, spend enough time on the animatic. It really, really helps to plan everything. Use layout sound, uh, just grab sound from movies or whatever and put them in the edit. You just get a so much better feeling for the whole film. Second thing is create a shot list, update the shot list. Don't create it once and then leave it somewhere because it looks good. And shot names in 10 steps, I already said that. Uh, we used a review platform. That helps a lot. We actually used Frame.io. I don't want to do too much advertising here, but it's a platform where you can upload shots. The client can review it, can paint into the picture, can give notes. And that's so much better instead of getting like trillions of emails. And the last tip sounds way cheesier than it's meant. I wrote down, make friends, not clients. So basically, we have a super, super good connection with uh, the guys from Village Green. I think they are also watching, so hi. Um, 
it was very nice. We had Skype conversations with them all day long. And a lot of clients say, yeah, when this project is done, we should have a beer together. And of course, we were in Germany, they were in London. And they also said that. And we, we thought, OK, this will probably never happen. But actually, two weeks, I think, after we finished the project, Sebastian, which is uh, the boss there, called me and said, yeah, we are coming on Tuesday. It's like, all right, you're coming on Tuesday. So the two guys jumped in the train and came for one day to Mainz. And I wrote down, make a bicycle tour, because actually, we did. And it was fucking amazing. So uh, it really strengthens the, the connection between you and your clients. And it's so much better to work together instead of for each other. So this is the team. This is uh, Seb. This is Martin. Somewhere is Basti. This is Basti. So this is me. And here we have Tom. So it was a fantastic project. And to end my, my talk, can I? Yeah. Um, I have, uh, we, we just produced a little breakdown of, of this whole project. It's a making of. You will see some shots that didn't make it into the final edit. But I thought it might still be interesting to wrap everything what I told now up. Okay, so. So, thank you very much for listening. If any one of you has questions, you can ask them now, or I'll be at the booth, so you can ask me there also. Excuse me? Yeah, sure, I can play it again. Uh, where is it? That's wrong. I'll take a picture for my mom. She loved that. Thank you very much. No, stop. Everybody stays where he or she is because he's got a picture for his mom. I need one for my boss. Please, <laughs> please pretend that you're very happy and you enjoyed this presentation. Raise your arms. <laughs> <laughs> And Don't you have some look. goodies to give away? And some Maxon shirts or... Raise your arms, everybody, come on here. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. <laughs> How did you like the presentation? <laughs> it was awesome! Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, one yeah, one question. How long did it? How long did this process take? The production? The production. Um... There were Christmas holidays in between and stuff. I would say pure production time, something between three and a half and four months. Something like that. I think it took a little bit longer because we had some breaks and stuff, but pure production time should be something around that. Any questions? Three. So me and the two other guys. So the, the question was how many people worked on this, right? So actually our core team were three people. Then we had Holger who did the 3D scan, which was an additional guy. 
and uh, the two guys at Village Green who did the art direction. And as I said, the, the contact with them were, were, was amazing. So we, I would say we are more friends than clients. And you have a mouse pad. <laughs> That's great. There's another question. Why, why did you choose Octane over other renderers? Why? Yeah. Uh, I mean, reason one for Octane was we were pretty familiar with Octane. We used it in the past. And uh, the other thing was really that we knew we had to render a ton of stuff. And uh, we had a lot of GPUs lying around in our office. And if it gets close to the deadline and you realize, OK, we need more, you don't have to buy new render clients. You just buy some more GPUs. And that was uh, the case here. So that was a, a good thing. All right. So thanks again. Thank you, Simon.